Hey everybody, I'm Matt. This is the 10 Minute Bible Hour, and this is the last part of my last video on orthodoxy. I've been doing a series, I think this is my fifth video on the topic. It's been a blast. I've learned a ton of stuff, but I cut us off on the first half of this video on this gigantic cliffhanger where I went and asked my orthodox buddy, Father Paul Trubenbach, whether or not in the orthodox tradition, I, a Protestant, would be considered a Christian? Am I going to heaven? And he was gracious enough to play along and answer that question that, of course, put him in an incredibly difficult spot. Here's what he had to say in the rest of the interview as well. Sure. Sure. I, I think we have to make a distinction between being inside the bounds of Christianity and being inside the bounds of the church. And of course, we can't really separate Christianity from the church, but the word we typically use are heterodox, which means people who believe in Christ, but are of different beliefs. They have different beliefs about, about God, about man, about the relation, about salvation, you know, whatever it may be. And so I, one of the images, there's no perfect image for this. I don't really know how to, how to describe it uh, well, but I think one of the images that, that uh, I heard somebody give recently that I liked for the most part was if you imagine an electrical cord laying on the ground, this is, this is all people. The, the, we're, we're, all, we're all created by God. We're all kind of laying there on the ground. Some are more frayed, some are less frayed. You know, the cords are in different shape, but we're there. Then you plug that cord in. That's Christianity. You're a Christian. You, you profess Christ. You believe that Christ is fully God, fully human. You believe in the Trinity. You're a Christian. But this is, this is one of those, those outlets where you have to flip a switch. And you flip a switch. Well, now, now, now the, the full energy is going through and, and now you're, you're in the church. And the reason for that is, again, that's not, that's not, the reason that image is not perfect is because that's not, I don't want somebody to say, oh, so you're saying that if I'm not Orthodox, there's no, there's no energy, there's no life to make Christianity. No, I'm not saying that at all. It's, it's an image, it's imperfect. But, but there is a difference. And uh, we see that in, at the end of uh, the first chapter of Ephesians, when, when St. Paul calls the church the fullness of him who fills all in all. So that's why I say when we, when we recite the creed, when we read the scriptures, there, there needs to be some sort of common understanding. And, and that's, that's unfortunately the tragedy of Christianity today is we read the same things, we profess the same things, but are we professing the exact same faith? There's a lot of really significant and essential disagreements there. So would I look at you and say, well, you're, you're not in the Orthodox Church and therefore you're not a Christian? No, I wouldn't say that at all. I would say this is somebody who I believe is seeking Christ with the best understanding that he has from the depths of his heart, and God can do with that what he wants. It's not my place to, to judge where you are in your relationship with Christ. If I were to do that, I'd be worse off for it. <laughs> That's not my place. My place is to seek God in the best way I know how, and I believe that he has revealed the Orthodox Church to be the church that, that he, he granted on Pentecost, that the Holy Spirit founded, that the, the apostles began. And so that's the path that I have to follow. In light of that, the, the Western view, and, and I would argue, and this is a place where I, I suspect we might see it slightly differently, mm -hmm. I would argue the biblical view of salvation is that clearly Christ did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Mm -hmm. That's what happened on the cross. There is an atonement. There is, a, there is a resolution to corruption and sin. There is an initiation of a kingdom that happens now and also in its complete realization later, not a problem for a God operating beyond the boundaries of time, mm -hmm. seems linear to us within it. And so there is this resolution to sin and death that is defeated in the cross by the, here's the word where I think we might disagree, substitutionary atonement of Christ. Right. And my understanding is that the Orthodox don't see that in the text quite the same way. Right, right. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a, a very different view on this, but I'd start by saying this. I think we made a mistake in history when Christians came along and said, I want to be able to take the mystery of salvation and fit it into one paradigm. I think we run into a huge problem there because the mystery of salvation is so vast so grand and it is so mysterious, can it really fit into one simple story? You may get different aspects of it, but this is not something you really see the fathers of the church doing a whole lot of. There were a couple theories early on, but, but um, the idea that, that uh, um, Christ's death was a payment to the devil, St. Gregory Nazianzus again came along sure. and said, I don't know if I, we, we, we can really say that. Though. Yeah, it didn't get a lot of attraction. And then Anselm came along with, with his theory. With each of these, these theories, I would say we have some issues. And the, the big problem, I think, there's a couple that we have with substitutionary atonement. 
Um, the first is that with many, not all, but with many people who believe it, death is a punishment created by God. Um, we would have a significant issue with that. That would not be yeah, and I, I was going to say necessarily not. the the whole of Protestantism either. R right. I think I think that the take you would get there would be death is an inevitability of imperfection and deviation from the perfection of God and His standards means that just the result of that imperfection is entropy, the second law of thermodynamics yeah, working against Which is much you. closer, yeah, to kind of what we, what we would say. The, the, the bigger problem, though, is that um, there's a sense in which what, what needed to be rectified, what was the problem that needed to be rectified, and that's, that's where a lot of the answers we find um, insufficient and, and problematic. Um, one, of the, one of the ideas that goes around is that somehow God's sense of justice was injured. But we would say, well, wait a minute, sin, sin doesn't affect God, it affects us. And so even without those details, because again, there's a, there's a, uh, this gets more complex than people realize. I've, I've seen a lot of cases where people said, this is substitutionary atonement. And I went, oh, actually, I know a lot of products that would disagree with that. <laughs> you know, the details there aren't so, aren't so close. So th there are a lot of little nuances in there. Our main issue is that it often is viewed in a very legalistic way. It's viewed as, as in terms of crime and punishment. And the Orthodox would emphasize more the medicinal aspect of it, the therapeutic, uh, with the idea of sin being an illness. And so, I mean, the story of salvation for us, and again, one paradigm won't do it. One paradigm. So this, don't take this as the Orthodox position. This is just one way to describe it that I think is a little bit closer to the way we approach this. When, when Adam and Eve sinned, to sin means to, I mean, literally to miss the mark, is the Greek word. And so if my focus is on Christ, to sin means I've taken my focus off of Christ. Hmm. So when Adam and Eve sinned, they took their focus off of God. Well, God is your source of life. So what happens when you remove yourself from your source of life? Death naturally enters in. It's a natural result. It's like if you take a flower, which you know, the two main things it needs are water and light. You stick that into a closet and don't water it. The, one, the water didn't kill it. The sunlight didn't kill it. It's just going to naturally die. And so when Adam and Eve turned away from God, death naturally became a part of their being. And with death came corruption, the reign of the devil, sin, disease, everything. So at that point, there's this division almost between God and man, the divine and the human. That's biblical. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, the, the way I like to think of it, again, because images are never perfect in this, but if there's a wall of separation, the prophets manage to climb that wall and look over it, and, you know, <laughs> face shining and everything, but okay. eventually they get pulled right back down. That's pretty Greek of you right there. That's Platonism. <laughs> That's a cave yeah. illustration. Somebody who almost made it out of the cave to see yeah. what was going on to yeah. come back in. There, it's, it's not to say that God had no relation with man at that point. Of course he had a relation with man, but death would ultimately, death was part of man's nature. And so even in the incarnation, we see healing beginning. Because in the incarnation, we have in one person, the divine and the human brought together in one person. So Christ begins healing right at that point. Then, with his death, well, he who is life had death try to cover him. And so when death tries to cover life, it realizes it can't contain him. And death shatters. Death just breaks apart and life shines forth and Christ rises from the tomb. This is, this is all part of salvation. And so, again, for us, it's more that sin is an illness on man's soul. And Christ comes to heal that. Now, again, is that, is that one paradigm going to cover everything he does? No, because we haven't even talked about his defeat of the devil. You know, we haven't, there's a lot of things we haven't discussed. And if you, if you go through the New Testament and look at all the names of Christ and think about what those mean, what are the implications for salvation, you can spend your entire life trying to find one paradigm that covers all of those things. I don't think you can do it. I don't think you can do it. So th th that's, that's where I would start. And again, there's a lot of nuance there and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things we could kind of play with. But for us, the main thing is sin affects us. And God, out of his love for mankind, wants to heal that and be our healer. And so we want the physician, the healer, to dwell inside of us. But there is a maybe an intentional resistance to the systematizing impulse we see in the West yes. on the question of soteria, the theology of salvation, that in the East, it, I don't sense that it's, you're trying to be difficult to pin down. It's that you're saying this is a, a multifaceted thing that isn't as simple as a legal exchange. Whereas I would look at the text and say, I mean, Paul, 
Paul explains the thing in a way that to me seems like oh, pretty clearly there was a brokenness to humanity and a resolution that could only be found in Christ. Mm-hmm. What's interesting is how much that seems to funnel Western thought toward the imagery that is, is not introduced from the outside in. It's biblical imagery that, that I'm leaning on here. Sure. But there's maybe this is a place where that sola scriptura impulse says, yeah, I'll go with the image that's in the text. Whereas the also scriptura is very important position of the Orthodox Church, which, yes, scripture, is, it happened in the context of the saints and the fathers, and it continues to happen in that context. And here's a whole bunch more thought from very early on that maybe offers other illustrations and imagery for this thing. The result, if somebody catches me in the elevator and they're like, what is the Protestant position on how people are saved? Well, it's this, 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 and here are Bible verses, and here's Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, and maybe I could walk you through Romans 3, 23, 6, 23. Let's right. go to chapter 10. Like, it's just, I mean, we just got a thing that we do, and, and, it's, and I think it's biblical, and I think it works. Right. I'm sensing you would need a much longer elevator ride. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you, we asked that question, you know, what do we need to, be, to do to be saved? I mean, St. Peter answers to that. He, he gives a, a long homily, and people say, well, then what shall we, what shall we do? What then are we going to do? And re, repent and be baptized. Okay, but what do we mean by repent? Hmm. And what does baptism entail? Hmm. Or, or St. Paul, I mean, we're saved by grace through faith. Well, that seems pretty straightforward. Until you ask, what do you mean by grace? What do you mean by faith? What do you mean by true? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yep. yep. And with each of these things, if it was just that simple where we could box it up into one formula, how come St. Paul doesn't use that formula in every single epistle he writes and just, just repeat it over and over and over again? Sometimes we're looking at things that from just different angles. Yeah, he's talking to different groups that were culturally... Exactly. I mean, if you look on a map now, it looks like everybody's from the same place. They should all think the same thing. But that was a very diverse Eastern Mediterranean world. That absolutely he was writing to absolutely. I, I think yeah, I'd be spot on. Yeah. So so none of that scriptural language we would never disagree with it. That's I I want people to make sure they, they don't misunderstand me and think that we're saying no 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 we found a better way to say it. No, it's not that. It's just that with every word of the scriptures we read, you it, to to read the scriptures objectively is not possible for mankind. Hmm. You always are going to bring some sort of life experience, some sort of mm-hmm. memory, some understanding of some word. I think you're right. You're going to bring that in no matter what. And so we think that the best way to do that is if the church is the pillar and ground of truth, you know, find, find the church that the apostles established and has a 2,000 year history. And if you find that one, then you can be sure that that's the, the right place to, that that's the right perspective from which to look at the scriptures. So when we're talking about the distinction on this topic then of just what is the Bible, where does it come from, how authoritative is it? It's not that there would be a disagreement about what is the text. I, I, inspired by the Holy Spirit, 2 Timothy 3.16, youthful for all of these different things. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, that the authors of Scripture are carried along by the Spirit. I mean, none of this would be foreign to you. Not at all. How many mistakes, like just theological or historical errors, do you see in the New Testament? Oh, none. So we would see that the right. same way. Like the, this is what God meant to say. Yeah. It's sufficient. You caught well, me off guard because I, I was like, like, wait a minute, what? Did you just ask that? <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was an, obnoxious, <laughs> an obnoxious rhetorical device on my part. I apologize. No, I get it. <laughs> but but I, think, I think the language that you would see in, a, in an otherwise completely orthodox statement theologically on the Bible, but from a Protestant perspective, was that, would be that we would include the word sufficient. We agree that the, the early church, the apostles, the authority of Christ... Uh, what is Bible and what is not Bible is really clear, really early. Understandably, there's some debate about intertestamental stuff that you don't see quite the same way as the Catholics, mm-hmm. but you see it closer than Protestants and you see it setting aside the Old Testament and the intertestamental debate. There's no disagreement between the East and West in terms of the New Testament pseudepigrapha, the New Testament apocrypha. You guys aren't tracking down the gospel of Mary Magdalene that we have half a sentence of. Right. We're in we're in lockstep yes. there. Yes. So so the issue would just be the order we put them together in. Where does church tradition come in for the Protestant? Yeah. Well, it's not co-equal at number one. Also, I think a lot of people outside of Protestantism look again at kind of maybe the more bedazzled genes, make a church version of it, and they're like, well, it doesn't factor at all. You've never even heard of the saints. Right. And that's true for a, a segment of Protestantism. Mm-hmm. It isn't true of my tradition at all. We're we're knee deep in this. Maybe a different list of saints that right. we know the stories of. Maybe a little more Western, but 
you know, yeah, we view these people as rock stars too. Uh, theology around it might be a little bit different. We read this. We see Protestantism in this. <laughs> I know that's just, I mean, I'm sorry, I, they're in here with us. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to commit sacrilege in your church, but, but it seems like to me, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that the difference isn't, we like the Bible a lot and you guys aren't really into it that much, or we think it's true and you guys are yeah, like, yeah, it's only mostly true. Right. The difference is how much does church tradition and the words and writings of the church fathers, how much does that speak into scripture? And how exactly would we arrange that on the board? I sense that you hold these more in equal esteem than a Western Protestant would. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, yeah. We, and we'd have to understand what holy tradition is. Um, I, I think there's a there's a mistaken notion that holy tradition is just a cosmic game of telephone. You know, we used to play that game of telephone when we were kids. Sure. Someone whispers into one ear and they go, "Okay, I'm going to whisper it next." And by the time the message is at the end, it's completely different than sure. where it started. And I think that would be that would be a legitimate um, um, complaint if that's all holy tradition was. But we, we call it holy tradition because we believe that the the church is not just an organization; it's an organism. Okay. And the lifeblood is, is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, is sent to lead the church into, according to John, all truth. Mm. And so there was a, a 20th century theologian named Vladimir Lasky, and he defined holy tradition as the life of the Holy Spirit in the church. Wow. Which is a beautiful explanation yeah. of it. And that helps us understand the place of Scripture, because the New Testament becomes an expression of holy tradition of the life of the Holy Spirit in the church. And, and the compilation of the books becomes an expression of holy tradition of the church, but also the interpretation. I think I'm close to understanding something I haven't understood before. So the scriptures can't be wrong about theology. Right. Can tradition? No, 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 no. Holy tradition, no, not, not when it is, uh, not when it is, um, I don't like the word codified, but when it is, when there is a, a, cl a clear official statement of the church as a whole. And sometimes that takes hundreds of years for okay. that to happen. So I've got a pretty clear picture of how the Bible happened. I really like the manuscript, lower criticism, text work. I find that really interesting. Mm -hmm. There's just so much. Yes. Yeah. But then we look at the church fathers and I mean, there are some of these guys from the second century where the only way we know what they thought is because Eusebius quotes them a whole bunch right. 150 years later. As an outsider, I'm taking what Eusebius quotes this or that person is saying, and I'm really interested and I'm really excited about that. Mm -hmm. But just in terms of data support, it, it, it doesn't do the job for me critically as right. much as the mass of data support behind the New Testament. How do you guys reconcile that difference in manuscript support between the two? Yeah, if, if the Holy Spirit truly does guard and guide the church, then whatever the church finally says is, is we believe God had a hand in that. Okay. And so, yeah, some of these fathers are, are less quoted and some are more quoted. Okay. And we believe that was a guided process. And so, so as much as we, you know, historical critical approaches to these things aren't wrong, they're not wrong in themselves. However, the life of the Holy Spirit in the church will be expressed in the worship. It'll be expressed in the hymn, hymnology. It'll be ex expressed in the ecumenical councils. We're going to find that in, in places where we can say definitively, okay, yes, even if I can't figure out why this is what it says, and so, <laughs> and so I, I can trust in this. I can trust okay. that God continues to work in his church. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful. That's really clarifying. Now, I think I mean, there are going to be a lot of people from... You know, again, from, from the West, and it's just, it's history, it's geography, all of that adds up to, uh, I'm going to go homestead in a place where bears are trying to eat me all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas we, we can't remember that in right. Europe. It's just, it's too far lost, into it's, it's water downstream. Well, it's a very recent recollection for the Protestant interaction with the frontier mm -hmm. and the West. And surely these two things shape the way we encounter the text, shape the way... We think about the individual's, you know, my level of optimism about the individual's ability through the illumination of the Holy Spirit to understand Scripture is going to be higher as somebody whose tradition is born out of the part of the Western civilization that is about mm -hmm. the optimism and the individual's ability to conquer nature, handle their business. Whereas in the East, you're talking about, at this point, thousands upon thousands of years of no, we are settled. We are civilized. There is a more of a notion of collectivism. I mean, we invented cities. <laughs> if you're from the East, you, you can claim things like that. 
And so, so it's just interesting to me to see how, how the two expressions really kind of just make sense based on when they happened. I'm not trying right. to, to you know, do an equivalency here. And no, say, no, so I'm sure you're saying it's the same. Yeah. But I, I wonder if there's something to that. Well, and, and it's also, uh, going back to one of the things, I, I don't l really love using the word, word authority because I think that became such a, it became such a touchstone of, of the, the difficulties and differences in the West. Mm -hmm. Whereas in, in orthodoxy, the issue of authority was, was never really pushed as highly. Um, it, it was never really so contentious with the issue of authority because again, if, if, if it's the life of the Holy Spirit in the church, you know, what do we look for? We look to blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. We look to those who have, have gone through the process and have purified themselves to the point that they look and act and speak like the apostles. It's one of the things I tell my congregation all the time. We should never ask, if the apostles were alive today, what would they say to us? Because the same spirit who inspired them inspired the modern saints of the church. And mm. we have saints who died in the 1990s and the 2000s. And, and so you can get a bunch of bishops together who claim that they, they're an ecumenical council, but the church can come later and say, no, you weren't. That was false. You know, and so, so just as with theology, and just as with salvation, there's no systematic way that we can go about it. We could do that also with, yes, there's structure and there's order in the church. But how God works through that, that can change throughout history. And he can do it in whatever way suits the time. Think of the St. Maximus the Confessor. St. Maximus the Confessor came along and said, Jesus Christ had a fully human and a fully divine will. He had two wills, and they're completely united with one another. But everyone disagreed with him. All the bishops, all the priests, everyone told him he was wrong. It was only after he died, after his tongue was cut out and his right hand cut off and he was in exile, <laughs> disappointing. That, they, that they had an ecumenical sin on this and, oh, actually, he was right. He was right. So how could he know? So they give him back the hand and the tongue. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. We kept these just in case yeah, exactly. it turned out you were exactly. right. So the, the, but the question becomes, how, how could he be so sure? There's only two answers. There's only two answers. Either A, he was a super arrogant guy who just refused to listen to anybody else, or B, he had had the experience of faith. He had had, he, he had such a pure heart that God had revealed himself to him. And he was not expressing what he thought. He was expressing what God had revealed to him. Hmm. And when we look at the church as a whole, we go, okay, one person can have that experience and still express it wrongly. That's why we look to the collective voice. So there's a mechanism for what happens if the collective voice seems to be getting it wrong for a time. Can the church be wrong? Well, if the church is divine and human, the human side can, can certainly be wrong and the divine will come in and correct it. And so when you say, can the church be wrong, it would be depend. Can the church as a whole be wrong? No, because the church is Christ <laughs> and Christ is the church. Christ literally self-identifies with the church. It's interesting. When, when Saul is on the road to Damascus and Christ appears to him, he says, he doesn't say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my church? He says, sure, why are yeah. you persecuting me? So Christ self-identifies with the church. This is, and, and, and when Christ said, you know, very last verse of, of Matthew, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. How is he with us? We believe it's through the church. So can the church be wrong? No, but can members within it be wrong? Absolutely. And so, can large groups of members be wrong? Yes. Okay, follow-up Bible question. But obviously also the language of the bride of Christ is used mm -hmm. throughout the New Testament. We don't see Jesus ever saying, I am the bride. He's always the bridegroom. Right. So there's, there's also language that indicates that they're, they're and, not and, the same thing. Right. And we see, we see the bride getting it wrong, like when Peter misbehaves socially in terms of how mm -hmm. he treats different groups within the church. I mean, we know they can err. <laughs> Help me understand the difference between the two. Yeah. Genuine question. I really want to understand. Yeah, it. yeah. You're right. We get a lot of these image, this, this imagery. Sometimes uh, the church is called the body of Christ, but sometimes it's the bride of Christ. And so there are always those, those two aspects of it. There's the divine aspect and the human aspect. The human aspect yeah. is ill. It's, it's sick with sin. It's, sin it's, it's really sick with, with egoism. And so it seeks to be purified by the divine aspect. And just as in any hospital, you have members who are more sick and some members who are less sick. And we look to the ones who have gone through this process of healing so much so that, again, when we look at them, we go, wow, he looks, he acts, or she, <laughs> speaks, writes, breathes, like I see the apostles doing, and mm. like 2,000 years of, of, of saints have done. Mm. And those are the voices where we go, okay, I, I can really trust this. 
And again, do I trust that voice individually over and above all else? No. It has to, it has to agree with the holy tradition that has always been there, and that's why we look to the collective voice. So an interesting thing that's been happening lately is there have been a lot of modern elders of the church, holy figures who have not officially been glorified as a saint, as a saint yet. And there have been a lot of prophecies, prophecies about viruses going around, prophecies about earthquakes, prophecies about hunger, about third world war. There's a, there's a bishop in, in Greece who talks a lot about these prophecies, but he says, I'm only going to share these with you if I can find two or three elders who have said the same thing. Hmm. Because we're cautious about that. We know that one person can make a mistake. It's, it's not as if you lose your complete sense of self and you're subsumed to the divine and you're just gone. No, you're still there. You're, you're still there. And so we look to their collective voice. And again, sometimes that comes out really clearly, directly, powerfully in a way that you almost can't deny. I mean, the first ecumenical synod, St. Nicholas was there, St. Spiridon. A lot of people don't know about him, but you know, read his life. And I mean, this is a great wonder worker. And so many of these incredible saints were there. At other times, it's less clear. And so you know, we, we tend to do things a little slowly. So we take, we take our time. We go, so, I'm not really sure what to think about this, but in time, we'll be able to figure this out. So somebody shows up, they watch a video like this. Like, that church is beautiful. And they're right. This is beautiful. They say, I am fascinated by the fact that every single one of these icons represents this elaborate, lifelong story of faith. And I want an elaborate, lifelong <laughs> story of faith that's a part of this same grander story of mm -hmm. this king whose icon adorns the ceiling here. And they don't know the first thing. They're not Greek. They're not from... Antioch, they don't know that's the first place that people were called Christians. They've never read the Bible, but they think there might be something to the God thing. Is this a church that they could come to to start, or should they go somewhere else to start? Oh, by, by all means, yeah. This is, this is we, we get, I'd say at least once a week, at least once a week, I get an email or a phone call or a text message or even just a person who shows up and says, I, I want to know more about this. Um, and so typically what we have them do is I, I tell them, I, I usually meet with them. I usually, the first question I ask is, how the heck did you end up here? Because there's always some story, you know, you don't, you don't end up at an Orthodox church, especially, you know, like this, without some sort of story behind it. I get a little bit of their history and then I tell them, why don't you come? Just, just come, come and see for about a month. Come to, you know, you can write down whatever questions. We can continue meeting if you want, but come and see for about a month get used to it because it's, it's jarring at first, admittedly. I, I, I was 10 years old when I first stepped into Orthodox Church. I, I told my parents, you guys are nuts. We're not doing this. I, I changed my mind. Well, and <laughs> you were coming from Missouri Synod Lutheran, which yep. is pretty Catholic looking. I mm -hmm. mean, it's pretty high church. So yeah, and, and it was still staggering. Oh, it was you. still pretty darn different. Yeah. Well, okay. So let's say somebody does that mm -hmm. and they take you up on it and they show up and they kind of learn where to stand a little bit and maybe... Mm -hmm. Four weeks in, they're like, okay, I'm getting it. I'm, I'm hearing what we're singing. I'm hearing what we're repeating. I'm seeing the rhythm here. I've read a little bit about this. All right, I'm in. Father Paul, how do I become a Christian? Yep. What's the answer? So we, we start them off by uh, making them catechumens, one who's officially being instructed in the faith. And this is, this is an interesting period. We, we, we have this last six months to a year, typically. That, that's the typical. In, in the early church, three years. You know, so when people hear a year, they go, ah, it's not three years, relax. Um, but the, the, the reason this is so interesting is although they are not full members of the church at that point, because they've committed themselves, we kind of look at, look at it as, as like an engagement is to a marriage. Now, okay. I mean engagement in hundreds of years ago style. Today, engagements are broken off left and right, no big deal. Early church, if you're engaged to be married and you break it off, you have to get an official divorce. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is a commitment. So becoming a catechumen says, I'm committed to orthodoxy. And it, we take it so seriously that if someone were to die, God forbid, but if they were to die before they were baptized, we would still give them a full orthodox funeral as if they were an orthodox because they, they'd committed themselves. What would happen to their soul? God willing, if they lived out their repentance, they're, you know, they're in paradise, they're in heaven. So is there a singular moment of like, I wasn't a Christian before, then I said I want to be, and then a thing happens, and then now they are? Yeah. Or is it process yeah, and this, and this is one of those areas where I think we have to be cautious of the language, because it, it depends in, on the context in which we're saying it. But if somebody is, first of all, if somebody believes in Christ and is seeking him, I would consider that, you know, a Christian. Um, if, if they become a catechumen, I would, I, you know, they can begin wearing a cross if they weren't already. That's no problem. They're a Christian. 
but are they a full member of the church? That happens at baptism. This is, this is the, the, the formal entrance into the church. And so again, that'll take place six months to a year afterwards. Okay. But the reason I'm, I'm cautious about that language, I know there's, people are going to watch this and go, boy, he wavers a lot. <laughs> like, like, well, no, the reason I don't want to make a definitive statement on, on that and, and be too overly sure of it is because a lot of this has to do with the person's heart and their sincerity. And again, that's up to God. Mm-hmm. But would I call them a Christian as a catechism? Absolutely. Absolutely. I've taken up a ton of your time. This is, I asked for half an hour. I think I just took an hour plus. So I, I thought this was the introduction. <laughs> I'm ready to keep going. <laughs> no, thank you for processing all of this out. I, I know you've done a great job of being patient because you're talking with a man of the West who's showing up. I mean, we both have beards, but our beards mean very different things. Yeah, you know, a little bitter. Yours is thicker than mine. Oh, you're, you're so generous. <laughs> no, it, it's a... And so I know that you're having to run a translator in your head for just how I'm wired to think about all of these things. And I think a lot of people sitting in on the conversation will really benefit from your nuance and, and artfulness in, in thinking outside these walls and imagining what it would be like for an outsider to encounter it. It's been really helpful for me. So thank you a ton. Thank you. Would you be up for doing this again? Absolutely. Like just pick a topic and we just go down one rabbit hole done, as done. far as we can. Maybe over some barbecue or something. Absolutely. I like the way you think. Appreciate it, Father Paul. Thank you. Was that fun? Because I thought that was a lot of fun. Five videos on orthodoxy. And I know some of you are like, ah, oh, come my thing only got the one video or only got the two videos. And the answer is, I don't know. Like, I just really don't know. There's no secret message in there. Like, ah, I'm going to punish these people. Your tradition is dumb. You only get two. It's just really how long it takes to work through the ideas. And the truth of the matter is I spent more time with Father Paul Trubenbach and Saints Peter and Paul Orthodox Church in Salt Lake than I have with anybody else that I've done one of these videos with. And that was a function in part of logistics, some technical details, scheduling stuff, but also uh, the ideas are slow. They take a minute to work through and to articulate. Whereas ideas at maybe a Protestant church that is a bit more action oriented, we try to do this with these people. It's just going to be a little bit quicker to get to the heart of the matter and get a sense of it for you. And so when I got all my material together and I sat down over there to edit my heart out, and it took a long time to get that tour video done. Like I was a, a month of staring at my computer, moving things around, trying to figure out how to best present that. And the technical side of that was really hard too. So it took a long time of thinking about this. But in the end, I was like, I just want to share almost all of it. It's all relevant, and if people are watching videos like this, I think they're game. Like Y'all are here because you want to think it through, too. I also know that some of you come at this from a perspective similar to my own or another group that maybe disagrees with orthodoxy historically, and you're like, why are you not arguing with him? Listen to the thing that he said. There's a Bible verse. Say the Bible verse that obviously counters the thing he just said and see what he does with that. And to some extent... I'm willing to throw those things out to just hit the ball back and forth, but I'm not doing it as a debate because I told him that it wasn't a debate. I told him I want to come and I want to learn about orthodoxy because I'd like to learn more about orthodoxy. And he was like, cool, come and do that. And so I don't know. He's smart. We debate stuff in other contexts from time to time when we talk, but here the exercise really was very simply I'm not trying to win an argument. I'm not trying to prove that my expression of Christianity is the once and for all final expression that was right and everyone else is wrong. I just really like to get you better. I would like to be fair to your ideas. I want to do the thing that, I don't remember who said it now, but somebody smart was like, hey, if you want to know if you're being fair to other people's ideas and you want to know that you really understand their idea, you should be able to articulate it pretty much as well as they can. Well, I am nowhere near that because Father Paul is exceptional, but I am much closer to being in a place where I could repeat the basic tenets of orthodoxy in a way that is close and is of goodwill and demonstrates a fair understanding of what's going on there instead of a caricature of what's going on there. And that's a lot of what I'm using these videos to do for me, and I hope they're useful for you. I want to get beyond the caricature understanding of other people's beliefs, stuff that I hear from somebody who maybe agrees with me and they're like, ah, these people are crazy and they think this and this and this and this. I would rather just 
listen. And if I come across things that I just don't think square with church history or reason or the Bible or theology, I'd like to not embrace those things on their own merits and to do so with a primary source instead of a secondary source as being how I learned about that. So it's not a debate because it's not a debate. It's an opportunity to learn. And if some of the questions come off as like, oh, this is an opportunity for debate. I mean, maybe, I don't know. I'm trying to be relaxed and just bounce questions back and forth. But Father Paul was excellent, knows his stuff inside and out. He's patient. I could see him calculate through all of the potential pitfalls that he has to deal with if he answers it the wrong way. And he navigated it, I thought, absolutely beautifully. So this is a great experience for me. I continue to be deeply convicted that all of these creedal expressions of Christianity, that is, the versions of Christianity that profoundly agree on the creeds, we agree on exactly which God we're talking about, the creedal language on the nature of God, the nature of Christ, is so specific from the classical world that there can be no ambiguity as to like, well, which God does an evangelical free church guy mean, though? Oh, no, the language is so precise. An evangelical free church guy, a Baptist, an Orthodox, a Catholic, they are inarguably talking about exactly the same God because of the shocking degree of specificity that was used in that early church language that even though we might disagree about some other stuff from the early church, we all definitely agree on that language and what God it is that we're talking about when we do theology, when we interpret the Bible. And so again, within a set of three, four, five key assumptions, these groups all are more or less internally cohesive as I look in from the outside. Orthodoxy makes sense if you answer those handful of questions a certain way. Catholicism makes sense if you answer those handful of questions a certain way. There's still room for disagreement within those camps. But like, I get it. Yeah, I can't just write that off as crazy. I get how you could think that. But also, I think Protestantism makes a ton of sense within a key set of assumptions as well. And we get so feisty with each other and I get it. We all want to be right. And who wants to believe in something that's wrong and your souls are at stake. And I I get it. That's why I do this stuff, because I do think it really, really, really hyper matters, not just as an academic exercise, but as a thing for the state of my soul. I I care about these ideas. I care about the implications. But it has really helped me to, to see this pattern that each of these different church leaders have shown me that, yeah, well, within your assumptions, I like I, I get why you come at it the way you do. I get why you do that. I get why you would never do that. I get why you wear this outfit. I get why you do communion the way you do communion. Okay. Roger that. And that's been very helpful for me. Uh, We're getting down to like the super intimate heart level stuff here, but I'm just going to stick with it. It's been very helpful for me because my time doing this YouTube channel has corresponded very closely to one of the weirdest, most abrasive, hostile, socially tense times ever. I mean, certainly in the history of my life, this is the worst it's ever been. it's, It's like we don't even see the humanity in each other anymore. We just burn each other down at the flip of a switch, the drop of a hat. And I don't, I don't like it. I don't like the way it feels. I don't like it when I've participated in it uh, to my unending shame. And I'm trying to figure out a way out. And in a way, these videos and the series you just watched are part of my constructive proposal for a way out. If I can really understand other people and if I can at least see how they would think it, And if I can earn enough respect and give enough respect that they can maybe see why I would think something else and we can learn how to incorporate the other person's dance steps conversationally, then maybe we could talk again instead of just camping up, tribing up and lobbing bombs at other tribes or other camps, especially among tribes that, again, name the exact same God with the exact same specific language We should be able to do pretty well with each other in light of the fact that we so specifically agree on who this God is 
even if we disagree on some of the finer points of exactly how everything plays out. And so this is a constructive proposal for me. I don't want to sit around on my butt and be sad that the world's divided and that my heart hurts and then get suckered into it from time to time. That makes it sound like it's everybody else's fault. And then willfully go into it myself from time to time and help add to the mess instead of making it better. I don't want to be the guy who just sits around and learns how to turn a phrase about how much it's awful right now and then does nothing and makes a living and carves out a little social space because I'm the one who can really see and really articulate how bad and divided it is. I don't want to be that guy. I, I want to be like the people I admire from history, the people I admire right now who see stuff that's dumb and they try to figure out a way to change themselves and to keep their hearts soft and to come up with a way forward to make the conversation happen, to make grace and peace and redemption and restoration and forgiveness and tolerance and patience with each other happen while also not sacrificing deep, hard earned conviction that I know you have about stuff. And that if you're still here, I know you respect that I have about stuff. So for me, this has a, a whole lot to do with a whole lot of things in terms of my own process of faith, but it also has a whole lot to do with me working through a better ethic of how I navigate the way the world is right now in a way that is redemptive. And it's not polished, it's not done, but I'm working on it. And Father Paul and the Antiochian Orthodox Church just helped me in that regard. It was a favor. It was a kindness that they showed me. It was a grace that they showed me. It made my soul better. It made my heart softer. It made my head more fully aware of what a whole bunch of my brothers and sisters think about things and why. And I'm better for the time. And I hope you are as well. So thanks for doing this. Um, thanks also, I'm just going to say it again quickly, to the people who make it so that I can do videos like this, the people who want this kind of internet to happen and are working on the same constructive proposal, the same redemptive project that I'm working on, you support the program at patreon.com slash tmbh, and that's why this happens. Please, please, please never feel pressured to do that. There's just, there isn't any. It is totally cool one way or the other. Uh, for a few of you, it makes sense to jump on and support the program, and it, it helps and makes a big difference. So either way, thank you. Thank you for caring about this stuff. Thank you for hearing me out as we got into... Uh, some of the deep water here in ways I, I didn't sit down and plan to do. I appreciate you processing it with me. I'm Matt. This is the 10 minute Bible hour. I really like you. Let's do this again soon.